I'd like to welcome you this evening. I'd like to welcome back those people that were here uh, last night uh, for uh, the first debate in this series on Muhammad in Islam and Christianity. Uh, tonight's debate is entitled Jesus in Christianity and Islam. I have a few uh, housekeeping rules and things to go through. Uh, the debate will be videoed for use in the public domain, uh, so I'd like you to be aware of that. I would like to ask you to turn off your mobile phones or to put them on silent uh, so they don't interrupt uh, the evening's proceedings. Uh, the format of the debate, there will be uh, a 30-minute presentation by both of our speakers tonight. Uh, that will be followed, followed by uh, 10 minutes each for rebuttal and then a further 5 minutes each for rebuttal. At the end of that time, our speakers will give a 90-second concluding statement. At the end of that time, there will be a time, uh, a 10-minute break, where you can formulate questions. We'll give you an opportunity to write those questions down. Those questions will be collected and given to our uh, speakers so they can then uh, answer your questions. They will both be given 10 minutes to um, answer as many of those questions as they can. If you don't get your question answered, please feel free at the end. Both of our speakers are more than happy to talk further with you and uh, uh, answer any other further questions that you might have or ones that didn't get answered. I'm a school teacher by trade and I've brought with me my school bell, so you'll hear that ring. Uh, one minute before the end of each uh, allotted time, I will ring that bell and then I'll ring it again when that time is up. If a speaker does go over their time, it will be deducted from uh, their, op their later speaking times in the debate. Uh, I would uh, encourage you uh, all um, not to interrupt or interject during the presentations. Uh, if that does occur, I will stop the clock so that the speaker isn't disadvantaged uh, in the, the time that they have to speak. Uh, if you continue to interrupt, then you will be asked to leave the auditorium. Uh, for those who weren't here again uh, last night, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Mustafa uh, al Kaji and Samuel Green, our speakers tonight. Mustafa is a final year a pharmacy student here at James Cook University. Uh, he came to Australia over 10 years ago with his family, from, originally from Iraq and then Syria and then here to Australia. Uh, over the, the past few years he's taken serious his um, interest in religion and has been diligently studying uh, sacred texts, the Quran, as well as uh, Hebrew and Greek texts. And uh, thank you Mustafa for taking your time in the midst of your studies to prepare for this debate and to um, present tonight. Uh, Samuel Green uh, grew up in Sydney. He studied engineering when he, uh, chemical engineering when he was at university and he currently works for the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students and he travels around Australia engaging with students about Islam. So it's an, uh, great to have you here. Uh, our speakers have agreed that Sam will begin uh, speaking tonight so I'd invite him to come up for his first his 30 minute presentation. Let's give him a moment. Well, good evening again, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm really glad that you can be here tonight as we continue in our series of, uh, of these debates. I greet you in the name of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to my Muslim friends here, Assalamu salam alaykum. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the Christian group on campus for organising this debate, and, and, and it's great to see this type of thing happening on our universities. Now, Christianity and Islam both have an understanding of who Jesus is. But it's very different. For Christianity, he is the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Prophet, the Messiah, the Servant of the Lord, the Priest, the Temple, the Sacrifice, God with us, the Word of God, the Glory of God. For Islam, he is a great Prophet, but only a Prophet. Now this topic really matters as we look at this comparison between Christianity and Islam because I think for many people they would see this as the chief difference between Christianity and Islam how they understand the person of Jesus and if you're trying to understand what Christians believe and what Muslims believe this is a great place to look and maybe a great place for you to judge which one is correct 
Tonight I want to outline the Muslim and Christian understanding and to explain and to defend why the Christian understanding is correct. Well, as I said earlier, I think that for many people they would see that this, uh, who is Jesus, is the chief area of disagreement between Christians and Muslims. They, they may think that, well, we sort of believe the same thing about God and the same thing about humanity, but where we really differ is at the point of Jesus. But what you believe about Jesus actually depends upon what you believe about God and what you believe about humanity. Let me explain. Uh, the Christian understanding of God and humanity comes from reading all of the prophets, from the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel. You'll see that in your handout there, that the Bible actually contains not just one prophet, but it's, it's all the prophets from Moses right through to Jesus. And so Christians find out about God from the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel, and we'll be looking at that tonight. There's no other book really like the Bible in that regard. Christians make no distinction between the prophets, and so we learn about God from all of them. And we sort of looked at this last night, but it's helpful to go over again. When we look at the, the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel, we see that God made us in his image. He made us in his image. That is, he made a connection between us and him, that we bear the attributes of God. We see that God is Father, that there is the Son of God, that humans are corrupted by sin and need more than just guidance, and that God accepts a substitute sacrifice. Now, at all of those points that Christians believe, you can see it comes from the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel, yet these are points in which the Quran and the Sunnah teach the opposite. They say we're not made in God's image, God is not Father, there is no Son of God, humans are not corrupted by sin but born pure and I just need the guidance, and there is no substitute sacrifice. So you can see we have a completely different understanding of who God is. Completely different. And we have a completely different understanding of what it means to be human. For the Christian, to be human is in the image of God, to share in God's attributes. Well, that's not the case in the Quran. Well, to be human in Christianity means to be corrupted by sin and needing salvation. Well, that's not the case in Islam. So we have a very different understanding of who God is and how he relates to his creation. We have a very different understanding of what it means to be human. And this means that we believe very different things about Jesus. It's right at the very beginning of the prophets where our difference is. And again, this difference is because for the Christian, their faith comes from the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel. While for the Muslim, it is from the Quran and the Hadith. I need to put that out first so that we get a context for, for what I need to say next. What I'd like to do now is to look at Jesus in Islam and to give that outline. Well, first of all, when we consider Jesus in Islam, we see first and foremost he is a prophet, one of the great prophets amongst the, the great prophets of Islam. Uh, he has the special title of Messiah. He is recorded in the Quran as doing miracles, but he's not the son of God. He foretold the coming of Muhammad. He only appeared to die on the cross and he will come again. That's a, a very brief summary of, uh, of Jesus in the Quran. But I do need to say that as a Christian reader of the Quran, one of the things that strikes me is the lack of details that there are for Jesus in the Quran. For instance, it will talk him about him having disciples, but it never mentions their names. It will never say where he is when he's doing things. It doesn't mention Jerusalem or Samaria or Bethany or, or the places where we know Jesus was. It doesn't mention dates. It doesn't mention the geography. It calls him the Messiah, but there's no explanation of that. I think I'm correct in saying that there's no parables of Jesus either in the Quran. It talks about his second coming, but again, there's no details of the second coming, just that he will be the sign of the final hour. This description of Jesus is certainly positive, but I want to argue is not correct. Uh, and I want to put forward three reasons. One is that it's not historical. Two, it doesn't agree with the earlier prophets. And secondly, it has led to false gospels. Let's look at the first one of these now. It's not historical. I'll just put forward a few details for you here, and I'll be keen to hear Mustafa's 
reaction to these. Firstly, the Quran gets the wrong name for Jesus. Jesus' name in Arabic is Yeshua. That's how his name is pronounced in Arabic. Yet in the Quran, it's Aisa. Now, this may seem like a small point, but the Quran claims to be restoring the historical truth of Jesus. And so I think it's reasonable that it would at least have the correct Arabic name. Secondly, it has the wrong mother for Jesus. Yes, in the Quran it talks about Jesus' mother being Mary, but it's the wrong Mary. If you have a look at that little diagram that I've got there for you, in the Quran there's a surah called Al-Imram, and it's about uh, Amram in the Bible, and it's about Amram's children and what they did. And it talks about Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and we see them mentioned throughout the Quran. But Jesus is said to be the mother of Miriam, or Mary, it's the same word, who is the sister of, uh, who's the daughter of Amram. And this is the family of Amram with Moses and Aaron. And so it's it's the wrong Mary. These two Marys lived 1,500 years apart. And I've given you the references there where, where you can look them up, where Mary is spoken of as the, the, uh, the sister of Aaron and the daughter of Imram. So it's the wrong mother. And finally, it's the wrong gospel. Please read uh, quote A there, where it, it talks, uh, a quote from the Quran. It says, They fight in the way of God. They kill and are killed. That is a promise binding upon God in the Torah and the Gospel and the Quran. Now what this is saying here, chapter 9 of the Quran is Muhammad's great commission surah and it's all about sending the, fourth, the, the, the troops out on jihad in what will become the Islamic Empire spreading from Spain right across to uh, India. And it's saying here that, that this command to fight for God and to either kill or to be killed it brings the promise of paradise and that this is a promise in the Torah, the Gospel and the Quran. And so that from this you see that the original Gospel taught this type of jihad and fighting for God. Now that is just false. That is not the Gospel message and there is no evidence that Jesus taught that type of military jihad. At another historical point, we see that the Quran is not an eyewitness. It's 600 years after Jesus. It doesn't claim to be an eyewitness, but it's not an eyewitness. And secondly, it's the testimony of one man. Now in the law of Moses, it's quite clear, it's quite clear that truth is established on the testimony of two or more witnesses. But what we have in the Quran is the witness of Muhammad. My next point now is uh, to move away from the historical question to look at the earlier prophets. And I've sort of looked at this already, but as you can see, the Quran does not agree that Jesus is the Son of God. Yet the Messiah in the, law of, in the, in the prophets and in the Psalms is the Son of God. And I'll be returning to that later on. The Quran also says that Jesus only appeared to die, yet the prophets before Jesus predicted his death. And we'll be looking at that as well. So the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms and the gospel all fit together, but the Quran doesn't. The, the picture that we have of Jesus in the Quran doesn't fit with the earlier prophets. My final point in this section is that the Quran itself has actually inspired false gospels. The Quran has inspired false gospels. The Quran, in a few places, makes this claim where it claims continuity with the previous prophets. Look at point B there. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet who can neither read nor write, whom they will find described in the Torah and the Gospel which are with them. You see there how it's referring to the Torah and the Gospel and saying that Muhammad's foretold in them. Or point C. O you unto whom the scripture has been given, that's referring to Christians and Jews, believe in what we have revealed, that's the Quran, confirming that which you possess. So it's saying to Christians, what you possess, you know, the Quran confirms this. Now the difficulty is, as I've shown you, that it doesn't. And this has led some Muslims to rewrite the gospel. The two that I'd like to draw to your attention are the Gospel of Barnabas and the Gospel according to Islam. I'd like to read the introduction to the Gospel according to Islam, and it's point D on your notes there. 
It says, the book before you, uh, so this is actually written by the author, Ahmed Shafat, who wrote the Gospel According to Islam in 1979. The book before you is a gospel. It is written in the light of the revelation of God uh, that God made to the prophet Muhammad. This outline is supplemented in this book by some background material derived mostly from the New Testament and sometimes transformed according to the Quranic revelation to form a gospel approximately the size of Mark. As we said earlier, this book is offered as a new gospel, a Muslim equivalent of and alternative to the existing gospels. Now you see what the, the Islamic uh, scholar has done there. He's very clear, isn't he? he he's got this problem that the, the gospels as, that we have in the Bible, they don't agree with the Quran. So he has rewritten them. He's rewritten the gospel and he's been very upfront in what he's done there. He's taken the gospel of Mark and he's transformed it by reading the Quran and changing Mark to agree with the Quran. Now I want to say that that's shameful. That is an absolutely shameful thing to do. But the reason why he's done this is that he's felt compelled to do it because even though the Quran claims to confirm the earlier prophets, it doesn't. The Gospel of Barnabas is another example from the 14th century. So my conclusion here is that the Quran's picture of Jesus, its account of Jesus, is not reliable because it's not historical. It doesn't agree with the earlier prophets and it has driven some Muslims to rewrite the gospel. Now the Muslim may say, yes, but the Quran is perfect. It's absolutely perfect and so it doesn't matter what evidence you give me, because the Quran is perfectly preserved, it doesn't matter because the, the, the Quran is, is perfect. Now we looked at some of that yesterday and that's points E and F on your notice there. And we saw that the early Muslims recited the Quran differently and that Uthman standardised one Quran and burned the rest. Tonight I thought we'd look at a, a Shia scholar, uh, Abi Yaqub al-Nadim. I mentioned him last night and I thought we'd look at him now. He's a fascinating character and has done us a great service in history. He was a librarian of the 4th Islamic century and the 10th Christian century and he wrote a catalogue of every single book he could find in Arabic and it is one of the great works of the, of the, uh, of the Arabic peoples. It's a snapshot of the 10th century from China right across into Europe of all the different scripts, all the different books, by this man who was like a librarian. If you notice at point G there, he has a, a catalogue. He puts all of his books in catalogues and point G is a catalogue that he has of books, of seven books. And the books are under the title of the books composed about the discrepancies of the Quranic manuscripts. I won't go through all of them now but you can see them there and this was an area of study of the early scholars as they looked at all the different Arabic, all the different collections of the Qurans um, the ones that Uthman had burnt. When you look at these scholars, you see that some of them had 110 surahs, some 116. The order of the surahs were different. Sometimes the verses themselves had differences, like the example I gave in that hadith, and they had different attitudes to the bismala as well. So I just put that up there because we can't just dismiss the evidence I've put forward by saying the Quran is perfect and therefore I can ignore everything you've said. That's not the case. And of course, I've got this book again tonight, which uh, has the differences between the, uh, Arabic, the, 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 the 10 accepted Arabic versions of the Quran that are accepted today. So please consider carefully my evidence. I'd like to move on now to uh, Jesus in Christianity. And I want to look at the, the same areas, looking at history and the prophets, and then finally Jesus and Jew. Now when we look at Jesus and history, we see that the account of him in the Bible is actually an historical account. It's put forward that way. It is based on eyewitness accounts from the time. The accounts that we have in the Bible are actually the oldest accounts of Jesus' life. And they come from his disciples. Not only that, but we have multiple witnesses. It's not just one disciple of Jesus testifying, but there are many disciples uh, and even his brothers testifying to him. And one of the things you'll notice if you read the gospel, and if, if you're a visitor here, we've got, we've, uh, got free gospels for you. Uh, one of the things you'll find is that it's full of details. So if you're reading the gospel, you'll see that it will talk about Jesus, it will name his disciples, it will say he was in this town, whether it was near a, a, 
a lake or not, and sometimes it will even say how far it was from one town to the next and whether or not they were even going up or down. Now, you need to understand that historians love that. They absolutely love that type of information. It's not just saying Jesus said, it's all this background information. If you look at point H on your notes there, uh, this is from Dr John Dixon, and he writes, Professional historians, regardless of their religious persuasion, treat the New Testament and its portrait of Christ far more seriously than the general public realises. You just can't dismiss the New Testament and the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John as just historical nonsense. The historians don't do that. They can be engaged with historically. We can also compare uh, their picture to history of the time. And when scholars do that, we say there is great agreement. I'd like to move on to Jesus and the prophets now. And I want to look at two areas in particular, the area of the Son of God and, um, and the death of Jesus, his sacrifice. Now, when Christians call Jesus the Son of God, I, I want to clear up for our Muslim friends here what we mean and what we don't mean. Now, what we don't mean is that God came and had sex with Mary. That's, that's not what we're saying. Uh, the accounts in the Gospel are actually quite similar to the Quran in that God sent his Spirit, <coughs> excuse me, and through his Spirit and the power of his Spirit, Mary conceived. So it's not that... Uh, we're saying Jesus is the Son of God in that God had sex with Mary. But what do we mean by the Son of God? Well, what we mean is what we learn in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel. Please look at point I there under the law of Moses. You see how the phrase Son of God is used there. God speaking to Moses says, Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go so I will kill your firstborn son. You see how the nation of Israel is called the son of God. The title son of God is not a Christian idea. Let's go a bit further. This time we'll look in the prophets at point J. This is, the one who will, uh, this is God speaking to King David. And he speaks of David's son who will be the Messiah, and he says, This is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. And so here we see that the king of Israel is, has this title of son of God, the Messiah. Another title for the Messiah is the son of God. When we read in the Psalms, point K, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Look at point L where we now see Jesus picking up all of these ideas. When you read the gospel, you'll see that Jesus is spoken of as the new Israel, the new son of God. He's spoken of as the new Messiah. And we read in Matthew 26, but Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. You see, this is what Christians mean when we talk about the Son of God. It's not a new phrase. It's not that the Apostle Paul or somebody invented it. It has a long history throughout the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel. And with the coming of Jesus, we see its fulfilment as he comes as the word of God, as God amongst us, as the glory of God. And so he fulfills the role of the Son of God. Now Christians do not associate with Jesus, uh, Christians do not associate uh, Jesus with God uh, in the way that Muslims associate Muhammad with God. Yes, we confess Jesus with God, but that's because we see that he is in the fullness of God. And so we have a different type of association there. So I want to argue that Jesus being the Son of God is consistent with all the prophets and it's not a Christian invention. Secondly, I'd like us to look at the, the death of Jesus. Now, in the law of Moses, we see that there's the Passover. This is a, a sacrifice that God gave to the Israelites when they were to leave Egypt. God was going to send his destroying angel to punish the Egyptians and the Israelites were going to be saved from the angel by killing a lamb and painting the blood of the lamb on the doorposts 
and on the, the lintel, the top part of their doors. And God said that when his destroying angel came by, came through Egypt, he would see the blood and pass over. And there would be a substitute sacrifice to save the people. And I've given you the quote there. There was also the Day of Atonement. The Israelites, when they were living for God in the land, persisted in idolatry. They persisted in sins and they defiled God's temple. And so God established the Day of Atonement. This was where two lambs were brought, two lambs or goats could be brought forward. One would be killed as a sacrifice uh, for sin, as a substitute for sin. The other, the priest, would lay his hands on it and confess all the sin of Israel. And then that lamb would bear it and it would be sent out and carry the sins off into the desert where assumedly it would die in the desert. But we see that there are those substitute sacrifices. Now the nation of Israel failed to live for God. They didn't celebrate the Passover. They didn't celebrate the Day of Atonement. And so God promised a day when he would again bring a new sacrifice. It would be like these other ones. But it would be different. This would be the great sacrifice that God would provide. And and I invite you now just to read with me a full chapter of the Bible. It's the prophet Isaiah. He's from around 700 years before Jesus. So this is written in Hebrew originally. It's been translated. It's 700 years before Jesus. And I, I want you to see how much the Old Testament foretells the coming of Jesus. So remember, this is 700 years before Jesus. Who has believed our message And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now to me that is absolutely amazing. Time and time again it says that this servant of the Lord is going to bear the sins of others, that he will die, that he will rise again. And he will make, bring peace with others uh, between them and God. Now that's 700 years before Jesus. That's not just taking a little verse out of context. That's the whole chapter. That is the context. Have a look at point P where it speaks about John the Baptist. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so I want to encourage you to believe in all the prophets. There is good evidence in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms and the gospel that God provides a sacrifice for sin. Now I know that our Muslim friends will say, how can one person pay for the sins of another? How does that work? And I think that's a fair question to have, one that the Bible itself raises. The first thing I'd actually like to point out is that there are certainly verses in the Quran which talk about each person bearing their own sin. But that's not all the Quran and the Son are actually say. Have a look at chapter 16 verse 25. It says, 
that they may bear their loads complete on the day of resurrection and some of the loads of those they led astray without knowledge. So you see, the Quran is not just each one bears his own load only. If you lead someone astray, you actually share in their load. So we need, my Muslim friends need to be careful with just looking at one lot of verses because there's more to it in Islam than just that. And I've given you those verses there to look at. It's interesting that in the Hadith, Ibn Abbas said that a man came to the Prophet and said, O oh, Allah's Apostle, my mother died and she ought to have fasted one month for she missed Ramadan. Shall I fast on her behalf? The Prophet replied in the affirmative and said, Allah's debts have more right to be paid. And so it's interesting there that you can actually, and there are actually several of these hadiths, that you can do a good deed that will be credited to somebody else. So Islam may not be as different to Christianity as you may think. You see, how is it that Jesus can pay for a bear our sins? I'm glad that several years ago, Kevin Rudd apologised to the indigenous people of Australia. I'm glad that he did that. But you know, he can only do that because he's the Prime Minister. You see, a Prime Minister has a unique role, don't they? They can do something on behalf of 20 million other people. Think about Adam. Adam in the garden, in the paradise of God. He sins, and because of his sin, we all are cast out. What Adam did affects us all. You see, not all people are the same. How can one man bear the sins of another? Well, not all people are the same. Some people in God's plans have a representative role for a whole group of people. And Jesus is like Adam. He represents a new humanity. And if you join yourself to him, if you come and put your faith in him, if you believe in what he's done for you, then he is your representative. The death that he died is your death. It is justice being paid for your sins. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. Not to go thinking that, well, I'm better than other people. I do these things and so on. I'm better than them. Or, you know, to be confident of myself. But to say, no, I actually need God's salvation. I need God to do something for me. I hope I've been able to show you today in the prophets that God has indeed done something for us. He foretold it hundreds of years before Jesus and you can see it today and it's this that I call you to come and put your faith in Jesus, to receive the love and the mercy, the grace of God. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Let us speak about Jesus, because the, the whole topic of tonight was in regards to Jesus in Christianity and Islam. In the handouts that you have, it's supposed to be two papers, hopefully you got them both. One goes through, it goes through the summary of what I will be speaking tonight, and the second one goes through the verses that I, uh, I will be using um, in order to explain about Jesus and uh, Lady Mary. Now let us see what Quran says about Jesus and his mother. Jesus is mentioned by name 25 times in the Quran. Where when it, when it is compared to the name of Muhammad, supposedly the writer of the book, his name has only been mentioned four times and once as Ahmad. Now there is no mention of the birth of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, neither the name of his dad or his, or his mother, or the name of his only daughter, or the name of his dearest family. There is no mention of their name in the Quran. There is a whole chapter in Quran, chapter 19. It has been given as an honor to the mother of Jesus, Maryam also known as Mary. Now in 73 books of the Roman Catholic and 66 books of Protestants, there is no such a chapter has been given to Mary. 
I would like to take you through now of how do we Muslims value Lady Mary. God says in chapter 3, verse 42 to 44, and angel said, oh, angels said, O oh Mary, that God has chosen thee and purified thee and chosen thee above the women of all nations. O Mary, Pray to, the, to thy Lord devoutly, and prostrate and bow down with those who bow down. ذلك من أنباء الغيب نحيها إليك. O Muhammad, these are the news of unseen which we have revealed unto you. Now, many Christians and evangelists, they, all, they, usually, they would say, which was the topic raised again tonight, how would a man who was formally not taught by anyone some, fifth, some 570 years to 600 years after the birth of Jesus comes along and tell us about the life of Jesus and what happened in his time. We're through this particular verse that I just mentioned. God assures him and through that he assures us Muslims that it is a revelation unto you, Muhammad. Now many evangelists would say, no, Muhammad, he could be a genius. It is a possibility. He could have wrote the book himself. Or he could have just dictated to someone else to write the book himself. And it is a possibility, we have to accept that. But in order to answer this, that Muhammad did not write it out of himself, let me give you this particular example. Now, has anyone have any objections that Muhammad was an Arab? For example, he wasn't French or British or an Eskimo. He was an Arab. Now, this Arab man, in first instance, talking to the people of his time, the majority pagans, telling them that Mary was chosen to be above the women of all nations. Not his own mother, not his own daughter, not his own wife, but a Jewess, if we put it in that form, that uh, the mother of a position is the chosen woman above all, uh, above all nations. Why should he say, say such a thing? He could have put his own, uh, the name of his own mother or the name of whoever was more beloved to him. Therefore you find that unless there was somebody else who's being commanded him that you have to put the name of Mary there, otherwise he wouldn't have done so. And the simple example of that, if I ask any of you people, who is the dearest person, who is the best person to you in this world? The answer wouldn't go. I would imagine you say either your sister or either your dear wife, either your mother, she's the best woman in the world to me. But yet Muhammad mentions a Jewess. Now the next point is the birth of Jesus, peace be upon him. From a Muslim point of view, Quran chapter 3, it continues from verse 45 to 47. If قالت الملائكة يا مريم and angel said, O oh Mary, إن الله يبشرك بكلمة من that God gives you a glad tidings of a word from Him. اسمه المسيح عيسى بن مريم. His name is Christ, Jesus, son of Mary. وجيها في الدنيا والآخرة. He is held in honor in this world and hereafter. ومن المقربين and one of the closest ones to the God. ويكلم الناس في المهدي وكهلا ومن الصالحين and he shall speak to people in cradle and, when he, and in his younghood and he is one of those righteous ones. Now Mary answers, Mary asks this question قالت رب أنا يكون لي ولد Oh dear Lord, 
How can I have a son? And no one has ever touched me. Meaning she, had, she did not have any physical contact. So the angel responded, This is how God cre creates what he wills. And for God to, to make something, he will just need to say it be and there it is. An instant action. Now, if Muhammad had made up this particular religion, which takes me to the, my, my second point, the power of ridicule. If he made up this religion from his own words and asked others to dictate it for him, he would surely know that there would be some time that we uh, Muslims will come in clash with Christians and the Jews and have dialogues like today's dialogue. So he would have given us some important weapon in order to subdue, say for example, the Christians. One of the most powerful weapons that someone can use is the, it is called ridicule. Basically, basically, laugh the guy off. Make fun of him. Now I ask you, you coming to me with an idea that a Jewish girl, some 2,000 years ago, says she heard some, vo some voices, and then she became pregnant and she gave birth to a child. Now do you really want me to believe that? I mean, imagine your own sister. She's the most truthful, never lied in her life. She comes to you, says, look, I had a vision, I had a dream, I heard some voices. Now I'm pregnant and the baby is going to come in a few months. Is your own sister, would you ever believe her? No. So how would you want to believe someone 2,000 years ago? Would you believe that person, a Jewess, a stranger to you? Naturally not. But we Muslims don't dare to say that. Why? Because God has said in his book, Quran, and Muhammad testified for that, and we all testify for that, that it was a miracle. The birth of Jesus was a miraculous birth. Now what is the first miracle of Jesus, peace be upon him? In our Quran, we don't have Joseph the carpenter. We don't have, uh, he was born, uh, Jesus was born in, in a stable. Basically, she goes, Mary goes to, in, a, in a place in east, and then she returns. After, uh, she returns after, child, after the child was born. Where God says in the chapter Maryam, chapter Mary, which is chapter 19, verse 27, So she came to her people and she carrying him. O oh Mary, Certainly you have brought us something strange. Ya ukhta Harun, ma kana abuki imra'a saw'in wa ma kanat ummuki baghiya. O sister of Aaron, I come to that point in the rebuttal time. O sister of Aaron, your dad was not a, a, a bad man. Neither was your mom an impure woman. Basically the Jews are insinuating that Mary has brought an illegitimate child. What could she do? Would anyone listen to her then if she was going to say, no, I heard some voices, now I have this baby? They were not in the mood of listening. I wouldn't be in the mood of listening to that. Now, she, because she knows this particular child is not, a, is not an ordinary child, so she points at him. The Quran says, فَأَشَارَتْ إِلَيْهِ She pointed at him. قَالُوا كَيْفَ نُكَلِّمُ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِي صَبِيًّا They said, with, by making fun, that how do you expect us to talk to someone who is still in a cradle, a little baby. Qala inni Abdullah. The response came from the baby. Said, I am the servant of God. Atani al kitab wa ja'alani nabiya. He gave me the book and he made me a prophet. So Jesus is not only a prophet, he's a servant, which is a higher rank to Muslims than a prophet. وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنُمَا كُنْتَ And he made me blessed wherever I am. وَأَوْصَانِي بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالزَّكَاةِ مَا دُمْتُ حَيَّا And he has enjoined on me prayer and poor rate so long as I live. وَبَرًّا بِوَالِدَتِي And dutiful to my mother. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْنِي جَبَّارًا شَقِيَّا 
and he did not make me insolent, insolent, unblessed. وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ وَلِدْتُ وَيَوْمَ أَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ أُبْعَثُ حَيَّا And peace be on me, the day that I was born, the day that I die, and the day that I will be raised to life again. Such was the Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God, say the Quran. So I reaffirm that he was born, he was born in a miraculous way. We are going together in this particular way. Now what is, what is Jesus in Shi'at's belief? Shi'at is the sector of Muslim, second largest sector in Islam. We have many sayings have brought to us from Jesus, peace be upon him. Let me read to you a couple of sayings. This is a book known as Jesus through Quran and Shi'at narrations. Talks about Jesus, obviously in Quran, and what we believe in, in our religion about him. I would like to read to you Jesus in his own words. We believe he was one of the most pious men ever lived. Truthful in, his, in all his life, never lied a single lie. Now Jesus in, in his own words, Jesus said, O group of apostles, I have thrown the world down on its face for you. So after me do not pick it up again, for among the vile things of this world is that Allah is rebelled against it. And among the vile things of this world is that, is that the root of all evil are in the love of this world. I have this in case you didn't understand it, you can come and have a look at it later on after the, um, the debate. Jesus was one of the prophets that, mean, that did so many supplications. Again, some of the Jesus' words. Jesus said, My servant is my hand, and my mount is my feet. My bed is the earth, and my pillow a stone. My blanket in the winter is the east of the earth, and my lamp in, in the night is the moon. My stew is hunger, and my motto is fear. My clothing is wool, and my fruit and my basil is what grows from the earth for the wild beast and cattle. I sleep while I have nothing, and I rise while I have nothing. And yet there is no one on earth more wealthy than I. Some of his supplications, for example, he says, O oh Allah, I take refuge in your name the unique, the one, and the and most high. I take refuge in your name, the one, the, everla the everlasting refuge. I take refuge in your name, O Allah, the majestic and single. I take refuge, O Allah, in your name, the great and exalted, by which all, are, all your pillars have been set firm. Remove the troubles I have morning and night. That's one of the supplications of Jesus and contains many of them in this particular book. Now, here comes the parting of the ways. I can keep going until tomorrow morning saying all the nice things about Jesus, but it would be a hypocrisy if I, if I do so. There is a major difference between what, you, what Christians view Jesus and what Muslims view Jesus is. We Muslims are made to say that Jesus is not God not God Almighty in human form, not God incarnate, and He is not begotten Son of God. Metaphorically, we all are, be are sons of God. God, the good and bad of us, and there are many examples in the Bible of that. But physically, we say God does not beget, because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal function of sex. I come to that particular point again in a later time. Therefore, we, we should not give such a quality to God. Now, the Christian, in his infatuation, goes out of his way to say he is the veritable Son of God. God begot a Son. In catechism, we, 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 
we know that when Christians say the Catechism, they say, Jesus, only begotten Son of God, begotten, not made. Not like Adam, Adam was made, but Jesus was not made. And I've been asking my Christian friends, could you please explain to me what does that mean? What is the difference? No clear explanation is ever given. Now I give you an example. Back in my country, or most of the Middle Eastern countries and cultures, we, for example, an elder person, when they come to a very younger person, they call them, oh dear my son, how are you? Oh dear my daughter, how you been? This is a normal way that we talk out of respect and love for each other. Now, but if that particular person tells his friend that, look, he is my begotten son, the whole meaning would change. It's not anymore a metaphoric relationship. It becomes more than that. It becomes a physical relationship. It means that I had something to do with his mother. Now he is my begotten son. Begotten, it's a word that is used for animal husbandry. In order to make you know, the, the, the bulls, this bull begot that bull, and in order to uh, see the progeny of a bull or horses. In Quran we are told, Quran respond to that. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say God is one and only. Allah is Samad. He is needless of all creation. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ He is not beget, he does not beget and is not begotten. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفْوَانَ حَدْ And no one is like unto him. Every evangelist cannot help not using John 3.16. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoso believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So begotten gets, has, been, has been stuck in our throat for, for ages, for years and centuries. We have been programmed this way, not to talk about God in such a manner. Dear ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, here I have two books. They are known as RSV 1952. I will come in that. They're here in, in case you would like to check what I will sing in a few minutes' time. Another issue that we have is the Trinity. We do not accept Trinity. For example, we say God is one, you say God is one as well. But then you say God is a triune God. We say no, He is the God one and only. So where, where is this particular Trinity? The clearest statement on Trinity is found on First Epistle of John, chapter five, verse seven, where it said, "For there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one." This is the clearest statement on Trinity in the Bible. Now, RSV nineteen fifty-two goes to the most ancient manuscripts. If you read the preface of the Bible RSV, it, said, it, it, it says that it, it goes to the most ancient manuscripts, where the other, other Bibles, they go to the ancient manuscripts. What is the difference of, between most ancient and ancient? Most ancient means it's 200 to 300 years after Christ, where the ancient manuscript, they came later on, means 400 to 600 years after Christ. Therefore, the one that goes closer to the source normally is the one that is more authentic to us. And there are, as you might, as you know of, I mentioned it yesterday, that there are 24,000 documents and manuscripts, manuscripts of these Gospels. The amazing thing is that no two are the same. And no two are identical. Which has never been, which the Gospels never do mention. Now, so how did you Pick, if I may ask, how did they choose Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John out of these 24,000 manuscripts? It's a question that needs to be answered. So your scholars in this particular RSV 1952, they have read 
and they have searched, and they found that the word begotten is not there. So they throw it out. Because it is an interpolation. It has been adulteration. Now 32 scholars of highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperative denominations, they said that the most ancient, most authentic documents that we have, that doesn't have the word begotten in there. So it was thrown away. And we admire this. We Muslims do admire such honest people. Now it took Christians 1400 years to find that this is a fabri fabrication. The truth eventually will come out. Now interesting thing is that they also throw out ascension, one of the foundations of Christianity. As the Paul said, without ascension and resurrection of Jesus, the Christianity, Christianity is just a hot wind, it's nothing. In four Gospels, there are only two places that ascension has been mentioned. One, the, the first place is Mark chapter 16, verse 19. And the second place is Luke chapter 24, verse 51. That Jesus ascended into heaven. In RSV 1952, Mark chapter 16, verse 9 to 20 is not there. Why? Interpolation. It, wasn't, it didn't exist in the early manuscripts. But later on, you find that in RSV 1971, they've all been stored again. That is an amazing thing. And when you ask the reason why so, it says in the preface that individuals and two denominations, they protested that, in, that it should be put back. Meaning the ascension, it should be put back. So we did put the ascension back into 1971 revision. Not God told them so. They didn't receive any revelation. No. The objection of people made them put it back in again. I ask why. Of course, by then, they had the best selling book. They made a profit of $15 million at that time from selling the 1952 RSV. Now, the idea of God incarnation is an Indian idea. For example, we see the seventh god, Rama, the eighth god, Krishna, the ninth god, Buddha. And they reasoned that God is so holy and pure that he come down on earth to experience our feelings. How would he know if I feel like committing adultery if he doesn't experience what I experience? Therefore, God must incarnate. It's a very interesting point of view. Now, Christians reject this particular idea. They say that before Jesus and after Jesus, God did not incarnate. Jesus is the only incarnation of God. We Muslims say, he, say God does not incarnate at all. He communicates to prophets as, through, as a mouthpiece of God. Basically, love them, respect them, and, but worship them not. Use whatever name you will. Jehovah, Elohim, Yahshua, Yahuwah, Allah, but don't contaminate the name. Now, for example, if I ever say that God's name is Muhammad, your, uh, your mind would take you to a man, an Arab man, riding a camel in the desert. So you see the name of God has been contaminated. You have placed a limit to God. That is why when it comes to image of God, we do not say for example, uh, Jesus Christ or Holy Ghost, the part of the uh, triune God. Why? Because as soon as you, have, you, have, you even have an image for God himself, the Father, when you hear the word Father, you would think that it's someone who's dangling his feet from heaven, is probably a million times bigger than the normal human being, with white hair, white beard, there is, and he walks on the heaven, there is a limitation to God. When you hear the word Son, do I ask you, what do you think of that? Instantly, you have the image comes to your mind that it is a, a, that this person was born from a Jewish lady. 
circumcised on the eighth day in a stable and named Jesus by the angels and eventually crucified. An image of a man. I ask you what is Holy Ghost? The image of a dove comes to you. When, he was, when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist, the dove comes, or also the fire in the Pentecost, in the form of fire in Pentecost. It is a vivid image, but it's still there. But when I ask a Christian, so is that one God? The answer is yes, that is one God. No matter what you do, you can never superimpose these images. Because as soon as I mention one, you have a different image in, uh, about that particular person. Now it comes. We have a history of Mubahala. There are so many dialogues that have been happened between Christians and, the Jew, uh, and, and Muslims. One of them, many, one of the many that happened during the prophethood life. It was on the ninth year of Hijra, a year before Prophet passed away. That year called the year of Wufud, meaning the year of troops. So many troops used to come to, the, uh, to the, uh, that particular city of the Prophet and have debate and dialogue with the Prophet, whether they were Christians or the Jews or Sabians. A group of Christians from the city Najran, south of Saudi Arabia, they came to, that, to the mosque of the Prophet and they were accommodated for three days and three nights. They ate there, they slept there, and they had a dialogue in that particular mosque, the mosque of Prophet. And one of the questions that was raised was, what do you think of, why do you Muslims disrespect Jesus? The Prophet answered, How, what do you mean, sir? They said, because you call him, he was a servant. He was a prophet. He wasn't son of God. This is a disrespect. You're lowering his, uh, his degree. Therefore, the prophet answered, which God revealed unto him. He said, That the example of Jesus to God is like the example of Adam. He made him out of soil or dust. And he told them, be, and there it was. But then when they objected towards that, they did not agree with that particular thing. Therefore, they went to have a, what is called mubahale, meaning a curse to, be, to, to come immediately on the, on the a group that is lying about Jesus. So they set a day the next day to have that particular appointment. And when Prophet went there, he took his, uh, his daughter, he, uh, he took uh, Imam Ali and his two grandsons, Hassan and Hussein, and he went to oppose them. But uh, uh, inter interestingly, Aqib, the head of the Christians, he said that if, they come, if the Prophet comes with his followers, therefore go ahead and curse him because he's a liar. But if he comes with his dearest people, he's telling the truth, don't do so. And that's what happened. They did not curse, and they asked Prophet for forgiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, I end my speech here, and I continue later. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. We're now going to uh, begin our period of rebuttal. And so both speakers will be given uh, 10 minutes to um, refute the, uh, the points that have been presented. So our first rebuttal will come from Sam Green. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mustafa. It was excellent. And um, I'd like to start by reminding people of what I said in my presentation, and that was I wanted us to consider who gives us the, the truth about Jesus in terms of history and in terms of how it agrees with the earlier prophets. And I've put forward my evidence to show that the Christian position can be engaged with historically and that what we claim for Jesus agrees with the earlier prophets, uh, while the Quran does not. Now I'd like to turn to uh, some of the issues that Mustafa raised. And in, it is indeed something that Christians feel with the respect that Muslims want to show to Jesus and Mary. As he points out that there is a chapter named Mary. And I have no doubt that Muslims do honour these people. Uh, I want to pick up on the point that Jesus is mentioned 25 times in the Quran and Muhammad only four times by name. Yes, that is true. But if you do Quranic exegesis, seeking to understand the Quran, you'll realise that every chapter of the Quran is in response to something in Muhammad's life. Muhammad's life is the context of the Quran. 
And so while his name may not be mentioned, you know, only, may, may only be mentioned four times, he is the context of the whole thing. So the, the comparing of the names doesn't really work there. You talk about honouring Mary, and I would say that is good, but from the Christian perspective, you honour her too much. You honour her too much. Let me just read from Mark chapter 3, verse 31 to 34. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and he told them, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those, who, those seated in the circle around him. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now, for many Christians, that's shocking because we feel this tension to elevate Mary. But Jesus is, yes, we remember her virgin birth and uh, that, that she's the mother of Jesus and we honour her like that. But we don't, in the Bible, in the law of Moses, the prophets of Psalms, only God is exalted. And we don't exalt the prophets in the same way we find with the Quran. I looked at this a bit last night where Muhammad is included in the Shahada and in the Salat and that's too much exalting for us. We don't do that with the prophets. You spoke about Muhammad knowing the stories of Jesus speaking from the, gra uh, speaking from the cradle. Well, I'd sort of mentioned that before in that that's actually in uh, uh, an Arabic work that was known at that time called the Arabic uh, gospel of the infancy of the saviour and I, I've got the references there and I can pro provide them for you and it has Jesus speaking from the cradle actually saying he's the son of God and the word of God and so you, you can look at what stories were known and so it's not that Muhammad had to have revelation to see that, that, that those stories actually were known. You asked how could uh, an, an Arab and the Arabs around him accept this story of Mary and exalt Mary the Jewess. I guess my answer to that would be in a, in a similar way that Christians and Muslims both accept other things that we might find difficult to believe. For instance, in the Quran it has ants talking, talking to Solomon. Now, how did they believe that? That's not a normal thing that you would experience. But because they're convinced of the truthfulness of the Quran, you believe it. And the Bible has similar miracles. Uh, and, and Christians would believe those even though we can't uh, see it ourselves because we've been convinced of the truthfulness of it. So I don't think just the exalting of Mary is actually proof either. You spoke about God uh, begetting and that this is sex and animal husbandry. Now that, that's a good point to raise and I guess I tried to raise that in, in my talk where I said it's not sex that we're talking about here. The way that Jesus' generation from God is explained in the Bible as, is as the word. You see, when God speaks, that is what is native to him. He is the speaking God. He doesn't create his word. He speaks, and from his word, creation comes into being. That's something we have in common. And Jesus is described as the word of God. That means he doesn't come from God as way of creation, but he comes as the word of God, as by the nature of God. Another description is in Hebrews 1 verse 3, that he is the radiant glory of God. So the, the, the glory of God shines out from God and Jesus is that glory. And so they're both monotheistic verses. There is one God who speaks, one God of glory, and yet it's describing a relationship within that God. And that's how we understand this begetting as the speaking of God, as the glory of God. Now you made reference to the Trinity in 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. I actually think that you, you may have got some facts confused there when you're talking about begetting because that sort of could have gone with another verse of the Bible. But you were talking about how in the, the RSV version they've taken, I, th I thought you were going to say they've taken that verse out. I'm not sure if you did say that. And that is correct. It, it is a Trinitarian type verse which is in the King James version of the Bible the King James translation, but it's not in a modern translation. And the RSVP, uh, RSV, <laughs> RSV oh, I'm getting mixed up there, RSV uh, is the one where that transition is made. Now, you can actually find out why just by going to 
pretty well any modern translation of the Bible and it'll actually have it written in the footnotes here. So here's 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, and it will explain why it hasn't put that verse in. It says, late manuscripts of the Vulgate have that verse. So that's the Latin translation. Um, but it's not found in the, in the Greek manuscripts. Okay, so the New Testament's written in Greek. So what it's saying is that the King James was influenced by the Vulgate and uh, by a, a later Greek manuscript, but it's saying no Greek manuscript before the 16th century had that. So the, in the manuscripts of the original language, it wasn't there. And this raises uh, a significant point, and that is that Christians are always open to the documentary evidence. And we're always working hard at, um, at confirming our scriptures, and if there's any doubt at all, putting it in as a footnote. Now, my question for Muslims would be, why aren't you doing the same? Because in the 1970s, a huge number of ancient Qurans were written, uh, sorry, were found in Sana'a in Yemen, up in the loft of the great mosque there. And there are a whole range of variants in them. Scholars are now writing on these. And interestingly, you know how I was talking about Uthman burning the Qurans? The Qurans are actually quite expensive. They're made out of leather. People didn't tend to burn them because that... They were you know, tens of thousands of dollars in today's language. What they did was they washed it off. But the original writing was still underneath it. And scholars using ultraviolet light can adjust the frequency to bring that original script to light. And it's actually some of these earlier Qurans from these other collections with a whole range of variants. So, yes, we have these in our uh, Bibles as the footnotes, and you can see them. They're all up front. None of them are major. And uh, it, it, like that one there is so obvious because it's, it's not even in the original language, it's in a translation. But my question is, why aren't Muslims doing the same? Why aren't the Qurans that you hand out with the footnotes of all the ancient manuscripts? Because your ancient manuscripts have a whole range of differences to the modern manuscript. And uh, Muslims are now having to deal with this. And hopefully that will appear in the, in the Qurans as well. Now you spoke about the incarnation of God as an Indian idea, well, again, this comes back to the different view we have of God. In Christianity, God made us in his image, that is, we share in his attributes. So the, Bible, uh, the law of Moses and the gospel says, be holy as I am holy. And so we are to be like God. And we see in the garden, in the law of Moses, that God walked in the garden. Now, whether uh, the Indian idea with its pantheism is not what Christians are talking about, it's quite different there, but the, I can understand why a Muslim may not understand it. It's because we have a very different view of God. For Christians, we believe the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel, they all teach that God made us in his image and there is a connection between us and him and that's the basis of the incarnation. You spoke about God being limited when he talks about image or father or son. But I want to say God is who he is, and he chooses to reveal himself as he chooses to reveal himself. That is his choice. If God chooses to make himself known as the Father, he chooses to make himself known the way he has, that is not for us to say we don't like that. As people who are created, we are meant to listen to our creator and believe in his message. And I've tried to show you that the message that Christians are teaching is in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the gospel, and therefore has a solid basis. And that's what I encourage you to believe. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. Now we basically, when we come to the, to the topic of Jesus, whether he said that I am God, or whether he ever claimed that he is divine. We also raise the question, did Jesus ever claim, listen to what I'm saying, did Jesus ever claim that he is God, or did he ever ask someone to worship him? I'll say it again. Did Jesus ever claim he is God, or ask someone to worship him? Let us see, we, all, we say that he claims what he is to be, and that is Messiah, and we confirm that. Because God said that I am, I am a jealous God, come directly to me. No other God should be associated with, with the original Father. On contrary, Jesus said, 
My father is greater than I. My father is greater than all. I can of my own self do nothing. Amazing words. A God, he cannot do things from his own self. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I seek not my will, but the, but the will of Father, but the will of whom sent me. The words you hear are not mine, but of the Father that sent me. He had given me a commandment of what should I say and should speak. Again, he has no authority. I, by finger of God, cast out devils. He does not have any power there. All power is given, given unto me. I, by Spirit of God, do these things. Of that day, knoweth no man, no, not the angels, no the Son, but the Father in heaven. Therefore, in my knowledge, I'm not like God, and in my power, I'm not like God. Then how does the divinity come about? He confesses. He says, I am what I am. And that has its own explanation. I've, I will go through that. Now it has been raised, the point here, that Muhammad did not, that, that Muhammad has sent people to fight in the way of God, point A and to kill and to be killed. And that's a promise binding upon God in the Torah and Gospel and the Quran. The word Torah that we have in Quran, it refers to the Gospel, uh, to, to the manuscript that Moses brought, the five books, the tablets. We do not believe the Torah is the actual Old Testament that you guys have currently in your books. It has been shifted. This is a Muslim belief. When it comes to gospel, the word Injil is used for, is used for gospel. We believe, because you, 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 you see that while you're reading the New Testament, it says in many occasions that Jesus, he was teaching the gospel in this particular place. He was carrying the gospel in this particular place. I ask you, was that the gospel of Luke, Mark, John, or Matthew? There was no gospel. It was the message of Jesus. He never... He never ordered anyone to write anything in his lifetime, and no one wrote anything in his lifetime. Therefore, to us, Injil is the book that God gave to, uh, to Prophet Jesus, which is not available to Christians today. If you have something called Injil Isa, the book of Jesus, please bring it forward. We confirm and we'll follow. Now, there is no mention of names of disciples. Also, as I, I did raise that point, that there is no mention of names of the Prophet dearest family in the Quran. That's why the Prophet said this particular saying, that I will leave amongst you two valuable things, the Book of God and my family. As long as you stick to them both, you shall never go astray. Therefore, when it comes to these particular things and these particular verses, from the Prophet's sayings and from his family's sayings, we know who these people are. And there are many examples of such Christians in the Quran. Now he mentioned that we give too much honor to Mary. We do not give too much honor to Mary. The people who give too much honor, are example, for example, are the Catholics, who call her a goddess, a mother of God. This is too much honor. This is blasphemy to us Muslims. He said that Mary... For us, Mary is a historical fact. It is not a miracle. When you compare that particular, when you compare Mary to a miracle of ants, and that we should believe in ants because it's something we believe so, this is not true. See, the Quran has miracles that up to today date, these particular facts were not known to the men that time. It had only been discovered in the, in the past 50 to 100 years. And the miracle of ants. The word ant, it's been used, the female ant in the Quran. Not the male ant, the female ant. And the miracle about that 
is that the head, from the biologist's point of view, the head of the colony are the female ants. And that female ant has the story that Solomon tried to pass with his um, people through the, uh, that particular path. And female ant shouted that all oh, get into your houses before Solomon and his people come in and crush you all. This is so accurate. The people then, they did not understand. The word namla means the female ant, so what? Namla, namla it was. But now we discovered that, oh, hold on. It is not a male ant, it's a female ant. We have other examples like that in Quran. We have the, uh, the flies, for example, the miracle of the flies, the miracle of female mosquitoes. These are all can be explained scientifically. Today's death that, they could, that this particular knowledge was not available to them then. So there is a difference in miracle and historical fact. Now he mentioned that, that there are so many different writings in Quran. And it has to and was washed off and now it's being ultraviolet. I'm not sure where is the source for this particular act. We have so many things to say about Christian scriptures too, but if I can I cannot back it up with sources, I cannot accept it. Now he said that he has a Quran and all the Quran they usually have the footnotes. I have a Quran here, I don't have any footnotes there. Why? Because we have the first writer in Islam, known as Imam Ali, peace be upon him. He was writing Quran, I mentioned that yesterday, he was writing Quran at the same time that the Prophet used to say it. The Prophet used to tell him the verse, not only him, there were other, about 50 other, or 70 other writers at, that, at the same time. But the Prophet specifically, because Imam Ali grew up with the Prophet, he specifically used to tell him about the particular verse and the translation of that verse and how to make it uh, and how the explanation of the verse is. What is the explanation of the verse? He used to tell him that this particular verse came about in accordance to these particular people. And of course, all the majority of the verses in the Bible, uh, in the Quran, they are surrounded about the life of the Prophet Muhammad because of his interaction with people around him. So we don't have different writings. We have that particular one book which God assures us, We have brought down this, bit of this revelation and we keep it safe. And it has been safe for us. We have the original documents, the manuscript of the Quran in Egypt and Turkey. And it's the same. What the difference is, it's the recitation of the Quran. That's a totally different thing because if I in different Arab cultures, different countries, if I take that particular verse and take it to that country, they recite it differently. That's why the Quran had to be written with vowels so people don't make such a mistake. And that's why, that is why that particular saying that they all were burnt, the Qurans were burnt and gathered, not all of them were burnt and gathered, if that particular saying is true, that particular event is true. Imam Ali is the actual writer, his Quran, he kept it, he did not give it to them. So we have preserved Qurans like that. I would like to finish my talk here, thanks. Well, thank you for that, Mustafa. And... Um, Thanks again for listening to us tonight. Again, I, I want to summarise what I've been doing. I've been trying to put forward the historical uh, basis because history is a great way for us to make our decisions and also according to the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel and to see how the Christian position holds its ground historically and is in accordance with all the scriptures. Now, let's have a look at um, some of the claims that were made here. He said that Jesus never claimed to be God. Now, where did he do that? Now, actually, I left my Bible there. I'll just go grab it. Well, he actually does on a few occasions. So I'll just do these quickly. In John chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus calls himself by the name of God. Uh, it says, uh, before Abraham was, Jesus is speaking to the Jews, and he says, before Abraham was, I am. And that is one of the names of God, I am. And the Jews, when they see this, they pick up stones to stone him because it's, uh, it's obvious the claim that he's making here. And you can see from their response how they understood him. You've also got in chapter 14 where uh, one of his disciples, Philip, says, uh, Lord, show us the Father, that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been with you for such a long time? 
Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And so Jesus is saying that he represents, and you've seen him, you've seen the Father. And then finally with Thomas, we see that Thomas says, oh, where is Jesus? I, I don't believe in him. And finally Thomas does see him, and Thomas's words to Jesus are, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, and Jesus accepted it. So that's uh, John chapter 20, verse 28. Sorry, I wasn't too good with all my references there. You spoke about Jesus being greater, uh, the Father being greater than Jesus, and I would agree with that in terms of the operation of the Trinity. What we see is the Trinity works by the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. And that's just how we see this relationship working itself out. And it's from that understanding that the, the, those sayings of Jesus are understood, that God works, the Father works, through the Son, by his Spirit. And uh, that whole area of Trinitarian study and understanding the relationships within God is an, an area that, that Christians study and uh, seek to understand those things. You mentioned that the Torah and the Gospel mentioned in the Quran are not the same as what Christians have today. Well, one of the things we need to understand is that what's in the Quran and its details about those books lacks detail, like it lacks detail about Jesus. So there's just not a lot of detail in the Quran. But if you look at points B and C on your notes there, you'll see it describes the Torah and the Gospel, and it says it's actually the Torah and Gospel with them. And in, in quote C, that this is the scriptures confirming what you possess. So it's not talking about scriptures in the past that are lost. It's talking about the 7th century and the scriptures that the Christians and Jews have, which we still have today. You spoke about Jesus not ordering his disciples to write anything. Well, he did. In Matthew 28, he commands them to go out and to make disciples of all nations. And that involves teaching of some description. And that's exactly what they did. You spoke about science with ants being in the female. Well, from my understanding of Arabic, most groups, most collective groups are in the female. And you can't push the gender to make scientific claims. Because it, 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 you just can't push gender to do that. A whole range of groups of things in Arabic are in, the, are in the feminine. It doesn't make any reference. You spoke about me not giving a reference for the, the manuscripts and so you shouldn't believe me. Well, I actually did. I said they're the Sana manuscripts in 19, that discovered in 1970. I said I've got a reference I can give to you here. And if you Google Sana manuscripts 1970, you'll find it. So I gave you uh, some reference there. You mentioned that there's no changes in the Quran. Well, again, I've, I've offered my evidence there. I've got a Quran with uh, about 4,000 differences. And I just um, ask you to consider that because I think we do need to be honest with the, the, the texts of our scriptures and not go thinking that we can just ignore the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms because it may be inconvenient to us. Uh, instead, I want to encourage us to, to believe all the prophets. Thank you. I just have to take this, you know, um, put this particular topic aside and explain it, maybe later a little bit more, uh, hopefully in the near future again, if I have the pleasure to, uh, with debating um, with dear Sam. Now the, the topic, Quran or the Bible, this is a huge topic, cannot be discuss discussed in one question or in five minutes time. It, it requires at least two lectures itself in order to understand whether which one is corrupted which one or you know which one is preserved so i would leave that you know uh, for later discussion if possible now i would like to come to this particular point i said i'll explain about mary the sister of aaron they say that mary sister of aaron there was a mistake you know as the maryam mentioned in quran as i as i re recited the verse or sister of aaron she is the actual sister of aaron about 1,350 years before the mother of Jesus was born. So there is this conflict, you know, Muhammad did not know the difference. This is the genius of the language that we have. A Middle Eastern language. Usually when we speak about someone's progency, even nowadays, today, we have, for example, the, the, the progency of the Prophet Muhammad. We call them, oh, son of Prophet. They're not the direct son of the Prophet. No, but they're from the progeny of the prophet. This is the same language in, in Hebrew. When they talk, they said, the son of this and the son of that. Now, I give an example why. You have the same example in the Bible itself. 
When we come to the genealogy of Jesus Christ, we say, we see in the two Gospels, it mentioned that Jesus is son of Joseph the carpenter. Jesus is son of David. The claim, Jesus is son of God. Now I ask you in your own language, what do you call a person with three fathers? It means, basically, this is how they talk. It just belongs to that particular, from that progency. It doesn't mean it's directly from the same seed. No. So please understand this particular point. So when it says Maryam, she was from the progency of Harun, of Aaron. And it explains it further in the Quran. All the details given. Now it says that the name of Jesus is Isa and Yasuah which is incorrect. Now I said yesterday, I explained that, that if ever Jesus Christ was to come in his second coming and you were alive, and you shout out his name, Jesus Christ, he will never turn his face to you because he doesn't know, he has never heard that particular name in his lifetime. His name in, in Hebrew, Jesus, is Yahshua. Yahshua in Hebrew, Yasua in Arabic. His nickname is so given by the Jews. His name in Arabic, Isa. This is the difference of names, and it does exist in Hebrew language, and this is what they used to call him. How did it come about to be Jesus from Yahshua, and Christ from Messiah? That totally a different point. You can see there is no relevance when it comes to them. It's not even close. The name's been Latinized, and therefore you end up with Jesus Christ instead of Yahshua, Messiah. Now, he spoke about that Jesus said, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And that's an indicative uh, point that Jesus claimed he is God. Now, what is the story behind this? You see, this is mentioned in John chapter 8, 58. Before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews took a stone to stone him. Now, nowhere did I said, my claim was, nowhere did Jesus say, I am God, I am God, or did he say, worship me? He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, for those who know the Bible. The Jews came looking for Jesus. They said, they are, he asked them, who are sick is thou? They said, we are looking for Jesus. He said, I am he. It's like, when poli if, if police come, down, come, come from this door, and they look for, for me. They're like, who's Mustafa? I say, I am. Did I just claim divinity? Did I say, just say, I am God? This is ridiculous. I mean, the word I am in Hebrew in the Old Testament is Eheyeh Ashar Eheyeh. It, uh, it comes about the story of Moses when God told Moses that go and, and save the people in the mount. God, uh, Moses asked God, what should I tell them? Who sent me? So God told him, I am whatever I am. Meaning, go tell them, I am who I am. What, what further explanation does it need? Therefore, this particular I am, it, it, does, it does not mean anything to us. And thank you very much for that. I'd just like to invite both of our speakers to give a 90-second uh, concluding statement. Thank you. Thank you for this evening, and if you've had a hard night listening to Mustafa and myself, hard because you've been challenged in different ways, um, I, I pray that you'll be uh, generous to us and allow us to present our evidence, because I think it's important to have our views challenged to make sure that we are, in fact, believing the truth. Um, I don't know any other way of us to be able to do this apart from to be able to hear from each other and engage in the way we have, and I want to thank Mustafa for the way that he's um, been involved tonight. Uh, Christianity and Islam have two very different views about Jesus. Tonight I've been putting forward that the Islamic view is not correct because it's not historical, it's based on the testimony of one man and it does not agree with the earlier prophets. And it's even inspired some Muslims to write false scriptures. The Christian view of Jesus though is correct because it is historical and can be engaged with historically. It's based on the testimony of many witnesses and it agrees with the earlier prophets. And it's how Jesus understood himself. And it also agrees with our need for a saviour. 
It agrees with our need for God to do something with us. And this is the great news of what Jesus has done, that he has died for our sins. He has paid the price for them so that we can be forgiven. This is God's gift to us. And this has the, uh, the, all the full assurance of the prophets in history and is the gift that God puts before you today. Thank you. I would like to thank you all. Before that, I thank God for giving me uh, the, the time, make, made the time available for me to come here and speak in front of great audience like you. I admire um, your, your courage to come and listen to us. I apologize if I have offended anyone in any way. This is, was not my intention. If I used a different tone, I apologize again. This was not my intention. But I am only explaining these, uh, putting these particular facts at the front because it is what we believe. And this is what you guys have come here to listen to. A different view about Jesus Christ. Peace be upon him. I thank Sam for coming all the way and I wish him the best. And I would pray to God that uh, I would again have the chance of uh, seeing you all here and seeing Sam again over and over over different topics that you guys might suggest us to do um, in the near future. Now, we spoke about Jesus Christ in Islam. I gave you evidences about what we believe is Jesus, how we respect him, and the differences with Christianity. And what does Jesus claim to be, not what the preachers preach to be. There is a big difference when you go to the scriptures about what is taught, preached by others, and, what, what is, and the, the, the difference about what is written about Jesus. Now he's got, Jesus had messages. His message was, was it universal or local? He said, go ye not in the way of the Gentiles. Speaking to his uh, disciples, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Also the second message that he said, I mentioned it last night, it was Luke chapter 1 verse 7, where he said, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot be them now. How be when he shall come, the spirit of truth, he shall guide you into all truth. So he had a particular message to come, which we believe was about the Prophet Muhammad, and I can give reasons later on. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Uh, we're now going to have uh, some time for you to write your questions. Uh, I would ask you to write your questions uh, as clearly as you can um, on a piece of paper and then we've got some people who come around with boxes, collect them from you and uh, pass them on to our speakers. Uh, would you please write at, at the beginning of your question who you would like to answer your question. So if you have a question for Sam, please write his name, Sam, and then the question. That will just make it easy for us to pass them on straight away. Um, why is a blood sacrifice necessary for atonement when God is all-powerful? Shouldn't the all-powerful be able to forgive those who genuinely repent without having an innocent man murdered? Well, um, I actually touched on this yesterday where uh, even in the Quran, it's not just that Allah just forgives, but that he multiplies your good deeds by 10 and either doesn't count or uh, does count your bad deeds as just one. And um, I know Mustafa yesterday was saying that it, it's got to do with whether or not your, your intention is included in that, but in the verse itself it doesn't have the intention part. And um, I, I point you to the verses that I put to yesterday, where even in Islam, Allah just doesn't forgive. The reason we have a blood sacrifice is, one, because that's what we have in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel, and so that's why we, we follow that. And we see that that is how God maintains his justice. In the case of Jesus, Jesus is not just an innocent man suffering. He certainly is innocent, but this is God come amongst us. This is God himself bearing the consequences of our sin. And so we don't see it as, as an innocent third party, but this is our sins being righteously paid for, the consequences being borne, and, and that is how God brings his forgiveness. Again, in Islam, it's not just a simple matter of forgiveness either. 
You claim that the biblical account of Jesus is an historical one and that it is supported by the law and prophets. Given that the authorship and historical accuracy of nearly every scripture you quoted has been disputed, how do you justify your claim? I guess I justify it by the fact that um, absolute knowledge is only with God and playing the sceptic doesn't actually work. So people, you know when people say to a Christian or a Muslim, absolutely prove to me that God exists. Now, absolute proof like that doesn't exist. You absolutely prove to me right now that we're not plugged into the matrix. Right? You can't. We don't have that. Life is not based like that. We make our decisions on probabilities and on things being reasonable and being seen to be reasonable. And in a court case, it will be beyond reasonable doubt. Now, of course, you can cast doubt over anything you want. I can cast doubt over your existence right here and now. But that doesn't mean it's a, a reasonable thing to do. The evidence we have of the Bible is that it's reasonable to come to these conclusions and there's no reason not to. Of course you can cast out, you can do that over anything. And, and I think that the fact that all the prophets have this one message confirms that that conclusion is valid. I've heard that there are some contradictions between the verses of Jesus. Uh, what is it actually? And I assume you're saying, how do you cope with those contradictions? I'd say that there aren't contradictions. But there certainly are differences because of the nature of the revelation. That is, the gospel in Christianity is not something that Jesus just recited. I think Muslims can sometimes think that it, we have the same type of view of revelation as you do with the Quran, that Muhammad just dictated it. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is testimony to what God has done. For us, it's all about what God has done in fulfilling his promises in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, and the gospel. And then Jesus' apostles are given the spirit to give a true testimony to what God has done. Now, the nature of eyewitness testimony is that sometimes different facts are reported differently. For instance, if Mustafa was to come around to my house with some of his friends, uh, he, my son may open the door and he might say, Mustafa is here to see you. But my daughter might open the door and say, Mustafa and his friends are here to see you. Now, is that contradictory? You might say, oh, look, it says different things. No, that's just the nature of eyewitness accounts. And sometimes we need to be careful before we say that's a contradiction, because it may actually be that the Bible is far more accurate than you're in a position to judge. And so I encourage you to just to read on its own terms and see how that works itself out. Did Jesus share the genetics of Mary... Are you that he came from her egg, or is he purely God? Uh, this is a great question that the early Christians wrestled with for hundreds of years. And uh, the, the, the answer that we've, uh, we've settled on is that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And we don't confuse the two together to make him a hybrid, right? But we don't separate them apart. Now, that's not an easy thing to maintain, but an example might be in the way that you see the Quran in that the Quran is the eternal, for the Muslim, the eternal divine word of God, uh, which is divine. It's, not, it, it's, it's on God's side. It's, it comes from God. Yet you can hold it as part of his creation here. And so it, it has an, uh, it, it's able to be part of this creation even though it is the divine word of God. And so the Muslim would see it as uh, created, in that I can hold it and speak it with my created tongue, yet the eternal divine word of God. And... Maybe that is a helpful way of thinking about it there. Um, many was accompanied by an, uh, Mary was accompanied by another Mary, one who's... Um, okay, when she opened the tomb and... Sorry, I'm just finding this one a little hard to read. I think you're saying that um, it was opened by the disciples. Again... This is talking about the different resurrection accounts, in that when they come to the tomb, it seems to be different accounts. Again, I'd say this is because of the eyewitness nature of the events, that if you look at them, they can be reconciled, but they're just bringing up different points depending upon what, what they're trying to teach you. And so it's not necessarily a contradiction because they may be reporting different things. How am I going for time? I have plenty of time. Uh, evidence has been given today that shows that Jesus, peace be upon him, described himself as an entity distinct from the Father. The Father is greater than I. And evidence which blurs the line between Jesus and the Father. These are contradictions. So which one is true and which is false? And did Jesus, um, uh, and also did Jesus himself pray to himself? That's an excellent question. And again, that's where I'd be saying that we see that 
the way that God deals with us is that it's the Father deals with us through, through the Son by his Spirit. And it's this relationship of Father, Son and Spirit that we see in God's activity, the way that he deals with us, the way that he reveals himself to us. And so there is a relationship between the persons, even as these persons share in the one essence of God. Now again, that is more complex than us. I agree with that. I don't see this as a contradiction. I see it as my uh, having to understand that God is greater than me and I need to accept him on his own terms. As I mentioned, the, the Father, the Son and the Spirit is in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms and the Gospel. And uh, but certainly the New Testament has it, its own expression of that. But, but those three uh, are, are all the way through. And, uh, and so Christians hold all of these together. I've read something about the Council of Nicaea uh, what about it? It seems popular. It certainly is popular. You'll get it in all types of books, in the Da Vinci Code, in all manner of arguments attacking Christianity. And it's normally that at the Council of Nicaea, the first Roman emperor to become a Christian, Constantine, made uh, the Trinity the official faith and belief in Jesus as the Son of God the official faith and, uh, and made the Bible and burned all these other Gospels. Uh, the Council of Nicaea didn't do anything for the canon of the Bible, so it didn't select what books were going in. That was something not actually done in any official um, uh, council. It was just done as minor points along the way and discussion between church centres. So there was no council just on that. Certainly the Council of Nicaea did formulate the, a, a Nicene Creed, saying that Jesus uh, was fully God and fully man and that we don't, um, uh, we don't confuse his natures. Um, but... This belief was one that was overwhelmingly agreed to, I think, with only two people voting against it and the hundreds of others not taking that view. And it was, sorry, hundreds of others taking the view. And the idea there was just that it was, um, that this was the agreed position already. And so it's not that at that point a new Bible was made or at that point Jesus being God was made. If you look at the early theologians before this time, they were discussing those things back there. And this was where a particular creed uh, was called for by the emperor. The final one, I had two here on, uh, why are you in the religion and um, how did you come to choose Christianity? I guess for me it came about when I was about um, 16, when I was reflecting on life and I was thinking about the people I loved and that the people I loved, what they did mattered to me. And as I pointed that, I'd been told by some Christians somewhere that God loved me. And so I had this revelation that if God, God loved me, therefore what I do matters to God. And I had this understanding that God was going to judge me because I wasn't living for him. And I actually had a fear of God. I tried to live God's way. I, I got up in the morning. I remember I used to get up early in the morning, read the, the, the Bible, trying to follow the laws of God. And I always kept failing and thinking, I will never have confidence to say, I am God's person. I'm, I will be a Christian. I just never had that. And then one day a man came and told me, he said, it's not about what you've done, but it's about what God has done for you. How, Jesus, how God has sent Jesus to pay for your sins. That is how you are made right with God. And it was... When I heard that, I just went, yes, that is right. I'd been trying to live by God's laws, and in my own heart I knew that I could not keep his standard. And when I heard about Jesus dying for my sins and the gift of God, I said, that is exactly what I need. Thank you very much. You might see me um, refer to my notes. But that's because I brought everything I had, all the research I've done. So if you do see me, I hope it's all right. Now, I believe I've been given more questions and harder topics than um, Sam was given for some reasons, <laughs> which each one of them, again, it requires more, you know, at least a whole um, hour and a half or two to be able to answer it. But I try to summarize as much as possible and make sense out of it. But the first one that is given to me is, what is Trinity uh, from Islamic belief? As I said, Trinity, I mentioned a little bit of Trinity in my talk, but it, Trinity is explicitly being rejected by Islam. Why God says, وَلَا تَقُولُ ثَلَثَا And don't say Trinity. إِنْتَهُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ Stop it. This is better for you. إِنَّمَا اللَّهُ إِلَهٌ وَاحِدٌ That God is only one God. Now, a Christian in the Catechism, they always say, that the Father is God, 
The Son is God and the Holy Ghost is God. But there are not three gods, but one God. They continue. The Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But not three Almighty, but one. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But there are not three persons, but one. Now I ask you, please, could you explain to me what sort of language is that? Is that English? I don't think so. What is three, what is one? Now for, I give you an example in order to explain a bit better. Say Sam, he had another two brothers, triplets, exactly look alike. And one of his brothers commit a, a, commit a murder, therefore needs to be punished. But they are so look alike, a triplets, that you cannot distinguish between them. But instead you catch Sam and you say, you're going to be punished for that. What is the answer you think it would be? That wasn't the answer. <laughs> it is not just. Why? Because Sam is a different person. There are three different persons. No matter how you're going to do it, you cannot superimpose one over another. I gave the example of what the images that you're going to have in your head when you hear the name Father, or hear the name Son, or hear the name Holy Ghost. Three di distinctive images. You cannot ever superimpose one on another. If I ask you, is God as one image in your head, and you tell me yes, I believe this is a lie. Why? Because totally three different images. You can never make it one image. Therefore, Trinity in Islam, and always the, the thing, uh, uh, the comment that comes is that, look, it's, it's a blind faith. You have to believe in it. It is complex. It is so complex for us, we might not understand. We cannot bear the amount of, you know, uh, this particular knowledge to understand what is Trinity. But what about when God says in the Old Testament, I am not the author of confusion. It is man who makes confusion for themselves. Therefore, the Trinity in Islam is rejected. The second question. What do Muslims believe is the basis of salvation? See, Christians believe that Jesus said that Jesus paid the price for their sins. He paid it by giving his blood. But Quran rejects this particular idea. Quran says Jesus was never crucified, but it was made to appear to them. Now, a Muslim gets a salvation as the same the same law of God applies for eternity without any change. You do the commandments because one of the uh, Jews when come to the Jesus ask him, Oh my master, my good master, what shall I do to get eternal life? Jesus replied in very humbling way, Don't call me a good master. There is no good but the, but the Father. Keep the commandments and you shall gain the eternal life. There was no question of somebody dying for somebody else's sin. He could have clearly explained that. Look, you have to believe in me. You don't believe in me. I'm going to die for your sins. You have no life. No. You keep the commandments, you will get the eternal life. But so many Christians are away from these particular commandments that was given to Moses. And I will come to that point. Now, I mentioned Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. How does salvation work in Christianity? It says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We agree with that. Why? Whatever you do, it is your responsibility. No one else will take that blame for you. I can't go, for example, speed 200 km per hour, yet have an imagination that my, you know, my friend is going to pay for the ticket. Nothing going to happen to me. You go speeding, they'll catch you, they'll find you eventually. So, the verse continues. Always hot Gospels, they put a stop where there's no stop, and they quote you from Galatians, Philippians, which is written by Paul. Paul, 
there is a continue to that particular verse. It says, The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. What does that mean? Father Adam, he made a sin. Should I be punished for that particular sin? How is that justice? A Muslim may ask. For example, I give you an example of a child stole a particular fruit from your garden. Is it fair that you go after the child, say, you, you know, smack him on the hand, don't steal fruit from my tree anymore? Is it fair after that? No, it's not enough. You're going to have to go persecute the child. And, af and, chase, and chase his grand grandkids as well. And generation after generation for that particular fruit that he took from you and ate? How is that adjust? That is not justice. This is harsh. I mean, Saddam Hussein was harsh enough, but, you know, that it's harsher than that. For generations, you persecute people one after another. Now, this is what God has been explained in Bible to us. That woman must suffer for eternity in, giving, in having the childbirth, in laboring. Why? Because of the sin that Eve committed. And men have to sweat for their breads because of the sin that Adam committed. Now, if Adam or Eve has consulted you and you agree to that particular thing, oh, you deserve it. You shall be cursed. But look, for me, Adam didn't come and consult me that, look, you know, I'm going to eat that apple, what do you think? And I agree to it. And I bear the sin with it. That is not fair. It's like a, a mother who gives her, her little child, three-year-old, a bag full of weights and expect them to get up. How is that a fair? A child must be born sinless, just like Adam and Eve were born sinless. This is the belief in Islam. And how do you put, if I am weighed with, with sin on my shoulders, how does God expect me to get up and stand and walk straight? Do you think this is fair? I don't think so. Not to me. Therefore, original sin in an Islamic point of view has been rejected. Only two questions. Um, crucifixion. <laughs> uh, we deny crucifixion, as I mentioned. But why? Hopefully I find that particular... Okay. Um, for us Muslims, crucifixion is basically a deliberate misunderstanding of the Jews at that time. And God, and we have an example of that, when they tried to throw Abraham in fire, God opposed them. He said, look, gather whatever you want and make a fire, a mountain of a fire, if you wish. And you throw them, but I will save him right in front of your eyes by taking him out of the fire without anything has happened to him. For us, it was the same thing with Jesus. When when the betrayer, he went and betrayed Jesus, one of his disciples, the Iscariot. God made it in Islamic belief. As a punishment, God made him look like Jesus. So when they came in the room and they captured him, he said, why are you capturing me for? Jesus is there. They started laughing at him. That, oh, now that you've been captured, you started hallucinating. That was the person that, took, that was taken and was crucified from Islamic belief. I have uh, many, um, many important issues that I can prove crucifixion did not happen from the scriptures. But that again, it's a huge topic, separate topic that can be dealt later. Thank you very much. Uh, would you join me in thanking both our speakers for uh, their presentations this evening? Thank you.